Chapters One and Two of That Affair at Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That Affair at Elizabeth by Burton E. Stevenson. Chapter One An Urgent Summons. That seems to be all right, Lester, said Mr. Royce, and handed the papers back to me. I'll be mighty glad when we get that off our hands. So I knew with the whole force of the office, for the case had been an unusually irritating one, tangling itself up in the most unexpected ways, until, with petitions and counter-petitions and answers and demurrers and what not, we were all heartily tired of it. I slipped the papers into an envelope and shot them into a pigeonhole with a sigh of relief. "'I think that'll end it,' I said. "'I don't see how there can be any further delay.' "'No,' agreed our junior. "'Neither do I. "'Are the papers in the Griffin case ready?' "'Not yet. "'I doubt if they will be ready before this afternoon.' "'Well, they can wait,' he said, and glanced at his watch. "'I want to catch the ten-ten for Elizabeth.' "'For Elizabeth?' "'Yes, I know it's a mighty awkward time for me to leave, "'but it's an engagement I've got to keep. "'You've heard me speak of Burr Curtis?' "'Yes,' I said, "'I seem to remember the name. "'He's been one of my best friends for the past ten years. "'I met him first at Yale, "'and a liking sprang up between us "'which grew stronger as time went on. "'I played a sort of second fiddle to him then, "'for he was president of the class in his senior year "'and was voted the most popular man in it.' he came to new york as soon as he was graduated and got a place on the construction staff of the pennsylvania road he was assigned to one of the western divisions and i didn't see anything of him for two or three years but finally he was recalled and we used to hobnob at the university club since my marriage he comes around to smoke a pipe with me occasionally and talk over old times He's a social fellow, likes companionship, and, my wife says, is just the man to make a woman happy. So when he wrote me a note two months ago announcing his engagement, we were naturally curious concerning the woman in the case, for his ideals were high, too high, I always told him. Mr. Royce paused and sat for a moment smiling out the window at the gray wall of the building opposite. "'I remember it was one evening early last winter,' he went on at last, "'that Curtis happened in, and, as we sat smoking together, "'our talk somehow turned to women. "'It was then I learned what an idealist he was. "'The woman to win his heart must be accomplished, of course, "'witty, knowing the world, and yet unsoiled by it, "'capable of original thought, of being her husband's intellectual companion.' so much for the mental side. Physically, well, physically he wanted a Venus de Milo or Helen of Troy, nothing less. I laughed at him. I pointed out that beautiful women are seldom intellectual. But he was obdurate. He protested that he would capitulate on no other terms. I retorted that in that case he would probably remain a bachelor." "'But,' I remarked, "'it seems to me that this friend of yours is a trifle egotistical. "'What has he to offer in exchange for such perfection?' "'Well,' said Mr. Roy slowly, "'it would be a good bargain on both sides. "'Given such a woman, I could fancy her longing for such a man as Curtis, "'just as he would long for her. "'I have told you something of his mental caliber. "'Physically, he's the handsomest man I ever saw.' "'and it seems to me he gets handsomer every year. "'In our college days he was rather too stout, too girlish-looking, "'but hard work and contact with the world have rubbed all that away. "'George,' he added, "'the children of such a pair would be fit for Olympus.' "'And did he find her?' I asked, curious for the rest of the story. "'After I got his note,' said my companion, "'I hunted him up at his apartments as soon as I could.' He let me in himself, got out his cigars, and sat down opposite me fairly beaming. I looked him over. I had never before seen a man who seemed so supremely happy. So, I asked at last, you found her? Yes, he said, yes. The woman you were looking for? The very woman. That impossible ideal? 
"'An ideal, yes, but not impossible, since she exists in the flesh, and I have found her.' "'Well, you're a lucky dog,' I said. "'Tell me about her.' "'So he told me, quite a Laura Jean Libby story. "'She was everything, it seemed, that could be desired in a woman.' "'And beautiful?' I asked him. "'For reply he brought out a photograph from his desk. "'I tell you, Lester, it fairly took my breath away. "'I felt as though I were looking at a masterpiece, "'say Andrea del Sarto's Madonna, "'and I would as soon have thought of marrying the one as the other. "'It was like snatching a star down out of heaven.' "'Curtis was leaning back in his chair watching me, "'and he smiled as I looked up. "'Well?' he asked. "'I went over and shook hands with him. "'I couldn't find words to tell him what I felt. "'But where has she been?' I demanded. "'How does it happen that she was left for you?' "'She's been abroad for five or six years,' he explained. "'That's no answer,' I said. "'Why isn't she a queen, then, or a duchess, at least?' "'She's had chances enough, I dare say,' "'and he smiled at my enthusiasm.' I agree with you that she's worthy to wear a crown, but then, you see, she has ideals, too. Perhaps none of the kings she met measured up to them. And you did? She's good enough to think so. I had been idling over the photograph, and my eyes happened to fall upon some lines written across the back. I didn't know them then, but I've looked them up since. My days were sunless and my nights were moonless, parched the pleasant April herbage and the lark's heart's outbreak tuneless, if you loved me not. I tell you, Lester, and there was a little break in our junior's voice, I was overwhelmed. You know, love, passion, the real thing the poets write about, has grown mighty rare in this world. We're too commercial for it, I suppose, too much given to calculating chances. But here I was, face to face with it. Well, I was unequal to the situation. I didn't know what to say, but he helped me. The date hasn't been set yet, he said, but it will be some time in June, and the reason I'm telling you all this is that I'm going to ask a favor of you. It's to be a church wedding, and I want you to be the best man. I hope you won't refuse. I was glad of the chance to be of service and told him so, concluded Mr. Royce, glancing again at his watch and rising hastily. The wedding's to be at noon today. You see, I'm cutting it rather fine. I'd intended to go down yesterday afternoon, but that Barnaby petition upset my plans. I'll be back tonight, or in the morning at the latest. In the meantime, if anything imperative turns up, a telegram to the Sheridan house at Elizabeth will catch me. Very well, I replied, and made a note of the address. But don't worry about the work here. I'll get along all right. Of course you will, he agreed, and an instant later the door closed behind him. But more than once in the course of the morning I was inclined to think that I had spoken too confidently. Mr. Graham, our senior partner, had broken down about a month before under a stress of work which had been unusual even for our office, and had been ordered away for a long vacation. One or two members of the office force had resigned to accept other positions, and the task of filling their places was one which required thought and care. So for the time being we were extremely short-handed. That morning, perversely enough, it seemed to me that the work piled up even more rapidly than usual, and it was not until the mellow chimes of Trinity, marking the noon hour, floated through the open window, that I succeeded in clearing away the most pressing portion of the morning's business, and leaned back in my chair with a sigh of satisfaction. That Majora Banks case was now ours. Mr. Royce would approve. No doubt at this very moment he was before the altar of the Elizabeth Church listening to the low responses. I had only to close my eyes to picture the scene, the dim flower-decked interior, the handsomely gowned, sympathetically expectant audience, the bride, supremely beautiful in her veil and orange blossoms, her eyes downcast, the warm color coming and going in her cheeks. "'Telegram, sir,' said a voice and I swung around to find the office boy at my elbow. For you, sir, he added. 
I took the yellow envelope and tore it open absently, my mind still on the vision my fancy had conjured up. Then, as my eyes caught the words of the message, I sat bolt upright with a start. It read, "'Come to Elizabeth by first train. Don't fail us. Royce.'" End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 A Bride's Vagary Two minutes later I was speeding downward in the elevator, having paused only long enough to give a word of instruction to the head clerk. A glance at my watch showed me that if I would catch the 12.38 I had no time to lose, but luckily a cab was passing at the moment, and I jumped aboard the boat for Jersey City just as the gates were closing. Not until I was safely aboard the train did I give myself time to conjecture what this imperative summons meant, but during the half-hour run to the little New Jersey City I had ample time to try to puzzle it out. One thing was quite certain. It was no ordinary emergency which had moved Mr. Royce to summon me from the office at a time when I was so badly needed there. I got out the telegram again and read it word by word. It affected me as a wild cry for help would have done at midnight in some lonely place, and it was just that, a wild cry for help. But why had he needed aid, when he himself was so clear-sighted, so ready-witted, so fertile of resource? What was this astounding occurrence which confronted him, this crisis so urgent and overwhelming, that it had shaken and startled him out of his self-control? The message itself was proof of his deep excitement. Apparently he had wired for me instinctively, finding himself suddenly in the toils of some dilemma which left him dazed and nerveless. Ever since the time when I had succeeded, more by luck than anything else, in discovering the whereabouts of Frances Holliday and solving the mystery of her father's death, our junior partner had conceived a tremendously exalted opinion of my abilities as an untangler of abstruse problems, and never lost an opportunity of referring to me such as came in his way. Every firm of practicing lawyers knows how frequently a case hinges upon some puzzling point of evidence, how witnesses have a way of disappearing, and Graham and Royce had their full share of such perplexing tangles. It had come to be one of the unwritten rules of the office that such points should be referred to me, and while I was by no means uniformly successful in solving them, I always took a lively pleasure in the work. It was no doubt that habit which had caused our junior to turn to me in this emergency. I could guess how terrifying it must have been to overwhelm so completely a man so well balanced and self-controlled. I could almost see the trembling hand with which he had penned the message. So it was with a certain quickening of the pulse that I stepped from the train at the triangular Elizabeth station, and an instant later Mr. Royce had me by the hand. "'I've a carriage over here, Lester,' he said, drawing me toward it, and I noticed that he was fairly quivering with excitement. "'I thought you could make this train,' he added, as we took our seats and the driver whipped up smartly. "'I knew you wouldn't lose any time, and I can't tell you how glad I am to have you here. "'Curtis is all broken up, doesn't know which way to turn. Neither do I. "'I had just sense enough to send you that wire.' "'I thought it was a mystery of some sort,' I said, beginning to tingle in sympathy with him. "'What has happened?' "'The bride-to-be has disappeared,' answered Mr. Royce simply. "'Vanished, skipped out.' For a moment I scarcely understood. It seemed preposterous to suppose that I had heard aright. "'Disappeared,' I echoed helplessly. "'Skipped out?' "'Yes, skipped out.' and Mr. Royce crushed his unlighted cigar savagely in his fingers and hurled it through the carriage window. I haven't the slightest doubt that she deliberately ran away. The sight of his emotion calmed me a little. At the last moment, I questioned. Practically at the last moment, less than an hour before the time set for the ceremony. She was getting ready for it, was in her wedding dress, in fact. I tell you, Lester— wait i said putting out a restraining hand begin at the beginning what's her name marcia lawrence and she's the ideal curtis imagined he'd found 
"'Yes,' said Mr. Royce slowly, "'and so far as I can judge from what I've seen and heard, "'she really was as nearly perfect as any woman can be. "'Yet she skipped out. "'That's why I'm so upset. "'She was the last woman in the world to do such a thing. "'Tell me about her,' I said. "'I don't know very much, "'but I do know that she wasn't a mere empty-headed chit. "'She was an accomplished and cultured woman.' I've already told you how her beauty affected me. I paused for a moment to consider it. I was fairly nonplussed. It seemed incredible that such a woman should, under any conceivable circumstances, deliberately desert her lover at the altar. And in her wedding gown, I murmured half to myself. Yes, in her wedding gown, repeated our junior, passing his hand feverishly across his eyes. It's unbelievable. It's... I can't find any word to describe it. I can scarcely believe I'm awake. Perhaps she found she didn't love him, I suggested. At the last moment? Stranger things have happened. I don't believe it. A woman like Marcia Lawrence knows her own heart before she goes that far. Suppose we say sudden insanity. Well-balanced women don't go mad merely because they're going to get married. "'Then she didn't run away,' I said. Mr. Royce looked at me quickly. "'You mean—' But the carriage stopped with a jolt, and the driver jerked open the door. End of chapter 2「Chapters 3 and 4 of That Affair at Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.' That Affair at Elizabeth by Burton E. Stevenson Chapter 3 The Lover's Story I paused as soon as we reached the pavement for a look about me. We were evidently in the fashionable quarter of the town. The street was wide, well-kept, and shaded by stately elms. The houses which stretched away on either hand had that spaciousness, that air of dignity and quiet, which bespeaks wealth and leisure. Here was no gaudy architecture, no flamboyant flourish of the newly rich, rather the evidence of families long settled in their present surroundings, and long accustomed to the luxuries of a cultured and generous existence. But it was to the house directly before us that I gave the closest scrutiny. It was a large one, two-storied, with a wide veranda running across the entire front. It stood well back from the street, and was sheltered on each side by magnificent trees. The grounds seemed to be very extensive and were beautifully kept. Along the pavement a curious crowd was loitering, kept in motion by a policeman, but staring at the house as though they expected to read the solution of the mystery in its inexpressive front. Mr. Royce nodded to the officer, and we passed through the gate. As we went up the walk I noticed that the blinds were closely drawn, as though it were a house of mourning and indeed dead hopes enough lay there. A maid admitted us, and when my companion inquired for Mr. Curtis, led the way silently along the hall. In the dim light I could see the decorations of palms and wreaths of smilax, relieved here and there by a mass of gorgeous bloom, and through a door to the right I caught a glimpse of many tables set ready for the luncheon which was never to be eaten. There was something ghostly about the deserted rooms, something chilling in the thought of this arrested gaiety, these hopes for happiness so rudely shattered. It recalled that vision which had so astonished poor Pip, the vision of Miss Havisham, decked in her yellow wedding finery, sitting at her gilded dressing-table in the darkened room, with the bride-cake cobwebbed and mouldy, and the chairs set ready for the guests who were never to arrive. Only here, I reflected, the clock should be stopped at noon, not at twenty minutes to nine. We turned into a room which I saw to be the library, and a man sprang up as we entered. "'Royce!' he cried, and there was in his tone such an agony of entreaty that I knew instantly who he was. "'No, no news, Burr,' said our junior. 
"'But here's Mr. Lester, and if anyone can suggest a solution of this mystery, I'm sure he can. Lester, this is Burr Curtis.' As I shook hands with him, I told myself that Mr. Royce's description had been well within the truth. I could join with him in saying that I had never seen a handsomer man or a more attractive one, though in his eyes, as I met them, misery and anxiety were only too apparent. "'It was very kind of you to come, Mr. Lester,' he said. "'Not at all,' I protested. "'I only hope I can be of some service.' "'Royce has told you—' "'Only the bare facts,' I said. "'I'd like to have all the details of the story, "'if you'll be so kind as to give me them.' "'Certainly,' he assented instantly, as we sat down. "'That's what I wish to do. "'I know how important details are.' He paused for a moment to be sure of his self-control, and I had the chance to look at him more closely. His face was not only comely, it was strong, magnetic. The black hair and eyes bespoke a vigorous temperament. The full beard, closely cropped, served rather to accentuate the fine lines of mouth and chin. There was no superfluous flesh about the face, no puffiness. It was thin with the healthy thinness which tells of a busy life, and browned by exposure to wind and sun. It was altogether a manly face, not the merely handsome one which I had rather expected. My eyes were drawn especially to his hand as he passed it hastily across his forehead, a hand firm, white, with slightly tapering fingers, an artist's hand, which one would scarcely connect with an engineer of construction. "'There's really very little I can tell you,' he said at last. "'When I saw Marcia this morning—' His voice choked, and he paused, unable for the moment to go on. "'Let us begin farther back than that, Mr. Curtis,' I suggested, knowing that the beginning was the hardest part. "'Mr. Royce tells me you were classmates. When did you graduate from college?' Seven years ago. "'And you came at once to New York?' "'Yes, to take the examination for the Pennsylvania Road.' "'You were given a place on the road at once?' "'Yes, not a very important place, but one with a chance for promotion, which was all I asked. I was stationed at Pittsburgh for three years, and then called east to work on the division between New York and Philadelphia. A year ago I was made assistant at the headquarters office.' "'Rather a remarkable career,' I commented, smiling. "'Not at all,' he protested quickly. "'I liked the work, and I was well equipped. "'I saw that I should have to revise my opinion of him. "'Certainly he was not conceited. "'When did you meet Miss Lawrence?' I asked. "'Last December, the 10th, to be quite accurate, "'just six months ago to-day.' Again his voice trailed away into a sort of hoarse whisper, though he tried desperately to control it. "'Won't you tell me about it?' "'Is it necessary?' he questioned miserably. "'I, I don't want to talk.' "'I know you don't, and I don't want to make you, but if I'm to help I must know the whole story.' "'Pardon me, Mr. Lester,' he said, pulling himself together by a mighty effort. "'Of course you must.' "'Only give me time. I'm—I'm—' I'm... "'All the time in the world,' I assured him, "'and settled back in my chair to listen. "'We had a bad grade crossing just east of Elizabeth,' "'he began after a moment, in a steadier tone. "'It was an ugly place, with the driveway coming down a stiff hill "'and meeting our tracks at an angle which prevented a clear view of them.' We kept a flagman there, of course, but nevertheless accidents happened right along. A skittish horse, once started down the hill and frightened perhaps by the whistle and rumble of the approaching train, would be pretty hard to stop. I nodded. I had seen just such murderous crossings. So the company determined to build a viaduct there, and last December sent me out to look over the ground. I reached there about nine o'clock in the morning, and by noon had all my data and was ready to come back to the city. "'Can you flag this train for me, John?' I asked the flagman, as I heard a whistle down the line. "'No, sir,' he answered. "'Can't do it, sir. That's the limited, but there'll be a local along ten minutes after it.' "'All right,' I said, and went up the bank a bit to sit down and wait for it. 
The Limited whistled again just around the curve, and then I heard the flagman give a yell and start up the hill, waving his flag like mad. I jumped up and saw that a buggy containing two women had just started down, and that the horse was beyond control. It didn't take me above a minute to run over, get the horse by the bridle, and stop him. I held the track record for everything up to the half-mile while I was at Chef, he added, with a little apologetic smile. I nodded again, only I thought I should like to hear the flagman tell the story. The horse had knocked me about a bit, he went on, and kicked me on the legs once or twice, so when I let go the bridle I was a little wobbly, made a fool of myself, I suppose. Anyway, I was bundled into the buggy and taken back to Elizabeth, where the women lived. Yes, I encouraged him, for he seemed to have come to a full stop. And then? Well, they took me home with them and fixed me up as though I were a plaster baby. The elder woman introduced herself as Mrs. Lawrence, and the younger as her daughter, Marcia. They made me stay for tea. He stopped again. "'I don't know how to tell the rest, Mr. Lester,' he blurted out. "'Only Marcia Lawrence was the divinest woman I ever met. "'Royce used to laugh at me for having an ideal.' "'Yes, he told me,' I said. "'Well, I knew instantly that I'd found her. "'She was very good to me, better than I knew how to deserve. Three months ago she promised to be my wife. "'We were to have been married at noon to-day.' He sat with bowed head and working face, unable to go on. "'We were happy. She was happy. I know it,' he cried fiercely after a moment. "'There wasn't a cloud, not a single cloud. "'It was too perfect, I suppose, too perfect for this world. "'I've heard that perfect things don't last, but I don't understand. I can't understand.' "'Mr. Royce told me she'd disappeared,' I said gently. "'Disappeared utterly. "'He was on his feet now and striding madly up and down the room, "'his self-control gone from him. "'There wasn't a cloud, I tell you, "'not the slightest breath of suspicion or distrust or unhappiness. "'Last night some of her friends here gave a little reception for her, "'and she was the gayest of the gay.' This morning, about ten o'clock, I called to see her. She seemed very happy, kissed me good-bye until we should meet at the church. A convulsive shudder shook him. I saw how near he was to breaking down. "'Let me tell the rest, Burr,' said a low voice from the door. And I turned to see a woman standing there, a woman dressed in black with a face of unusual sweetness, but shadowed by a great sorrow.' End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 A Strange Message I guessed in a breath who she was, and my heart went out to her in instant pity. Yet a second glance told me that it was not the shadow of this recent sorrow which lay across her face. Time alone could grave those lines of calm endurance, could give to the eyes that look of quiet resignation, to the mouth that curve of patient suffering, and only a deep spiritual faith could preserve and heighten the sweetness and gentleness of a countenance so marked. "'This is Mr. Lester, Mrs. Lawrence,' said our junior quickly, and placed a chair for her. "'We've asked Mr. Lester to help us,' he added. She closed the door behind her and came forward as we rose, acknowledging the introduction with the faintest of bows. "'Thank you,' she said. "'Lucy told me you had returned, Mr. Royce,' she went on a little tremulously, "'and I was anxious to know if you had any news.' "'Not yet. Mr. Curtis was just telling Mr. Lester. "'Yes,' she interrupted. "'I saw how he was suffering, and I wished to spare him if I could.' "'My dear Mrs. Lawrence,' broke in Curtis, "'you must think only of sparing yourself.' "'Still,' I suggested, "'it's possible that Mrs. Lawrence can help us a great deal, if she will.' She was holding herself admirably in hand, and I thought her in much less danger of breaking down than Curtis himself. Perhaps the old sorrow had taught her how to bear the new one. "'I shall be glad to help you all I can,' she said, and smiled a faint encouragement." It seemed brutal to question her at such a time, but I saw it must be done, and I nerved myself to do it. 
"'Mrs. Lawrence,' I began, "'has any possible explanation of your daughter's flight occurred to you?' "'No,' she answered quickly, and with an emphasis that rather startled me. "'It seems to me utterly unexplainable. "'Even yet I can scarcely believe it. "'She left no message for you? "'Not a word. "'She simply disappeared. "'And you had no warning?' "'Warning?' she repeated, facing around upon me. "'No.' nor suspected that there was anything amiss? Not for an instant. Since there was something amiss, why did your daughter not confide in you? I have asked myself the same question. I am utterly unable to answer it. She was in the habit of coming to you with her troubles? Always. There was the most perfect confidence between us. And yet she concealed this. "'She did not conceal it,' she protested. "'She could not have concealed it from my eyes, even had she wished to. "'There was nothing to conceal. "'There was absolutely nothing wrong the last time I saw her. "'And that was? "'Only a few minutes before she disappeared. "'Will you tell me just what happened?' I suggested as gently as I could. "'Every detail you can remember.' "'She sat for a moment with compressed lips, steadying herself.' "'There's very little to tell,' she began. "'She was quite her usual self this morning, so far as I could see, and very happy. Two or three of her girlfriends came in to see her for a moment to talk over the final arrangements, and she was giving some directions about the decorations when Mr. Curtis called. After he had gone, she made a last trip through the house to see that all was right, and then started upstairs to dress.' Half an hour later she came to my room in her wedding gown to ask how she looked, and I had never seen her looking more beautiful. Only perfect happiness can give such beauty to a woman. I remember thinking what a joy it was to me that she had found a man whom she could love as she loved. A half-stifled, choking sob from Curtis interrupted her. She turned and stretched out her hand to him with a gesture of infinite affection. I finished dressing, she continued, and then went to Marcia's room, but she wasn't there. Her maid said she'd been called downstairs for a moment. I came down and found that the decorator had wanted her opinion of the final touches. She had left him to go upstairs again, as he supposed. It was then nearly half-past eleven, and the bridesmaids began to arrive. I supposed Marcia was in the grounds somewhere and sent two of the servants to look for her and to tell her it was time to start for the church. They came back saying she was not to be found. Then I began to be alarmed, thinking that perhaps she had been taken suddenly ill, and we searched the house and grounds systematically but found no trace of her. At last it seemed just possible that she had gone on to the church and the bridesmaids hurried into the carriages and drove away. But she wasn't there, only Burr waiting for her. She stopped with a sudden tremulousness. "'Thank you,' I said. "'There's one question I must ask, Mrs. Lawrence, before I can go to work intelligently. You will pardon it. Had your daughter ever had any attachment previous to this one?' I saw Curtis glance at her quickly. That solution of the problem had occurred to him then, too. "'Not the shadow of one,' answered Mrs. Lawrence instantly, and perhaps it was only my fancy that the accent of sincerity was a trifle forced. I have been Marcia's companion and confidant all her life, and I am sure that no man ever distinctly interested her until she met Mr. Curtis. "'But she no doubt interested many men,' I suggested." "'Yes, but never with intention. "'That only makes the case more desperate sometimes. "'I don't believe there were any desperate cases. "'You will remember,' she added, "'that we lived much abroad "'and so had few intimate acquaintances. "'Besides, Marcia was, well, extremely patriotic. "'She often said that she would marry only an American, "'and an American who lived at home "'and was proud of his country.' "'One doesn't meet many of that kind in Europe.' "'No,' I agreed. "'Whatever my doubts might be, "'it was clearly impossible at present "'to proceed any further along that line of inquiry. "'And what other line lay open? "'It seemed to me that I had come to an impasse, "'a closed way which barred further progress. "'I sat silent a moment, pondering the problem. 
Perhaps Mrs. Lawrence held the key to it, and I turned to look at her. She was seemingly sunk in reverie, and her lips moved from time to time, as though she were repeating to herself some fragmentary words. She seemed more self-possessed in the presence of this catastrophe than one would have expected. Perhaps she knew where her daughter was. Perhaps Miss Lawrence had not really fled. There was nothing to show that she had left the house. It seemed impossible that a woman clad as she had been could have fled in broad day without attracting someone's notice. But whether she had fled or not, I reflected, the mystery remained the same. Certainly she had not appeared at the altar to keep her promise to Burr Curtis. "'Mrs. Lawrence,' I asked, "'what reason have you to believe that your daughter left the house?' She started from her reverie and sat staring at me as though scarce understanding. Why, she said at last, what else could she have done? She has disappeared. You're sure she isn't concealed somewhere about the place? Concealed? And she paled a little under my eyes. Oh, no, that's impossible. We've searched everywhere. And you think she went of her own free will? "'She could scarcely have been abducted,' she retorted. "'Marcia is a strong girl, and a single scream would have alarmed the house.' "'That's true,' I agreed. "'Your room is near hers? "'Just across the hall.' "'The wish flashed into my brain to look through the house. "'Perhaps I should be able to arrange it. "'There's no pit or hole or trap or anything of that sort "'into which she could have fallen?' "'Oh, no, nothing of the sort.' "'Nor closet, nor chest, into which she could have accidentally locked herself?' I went on, remembering the fate of the bride in the old song. "'No. Besides, we've looked in them all. We've searched everywhere, every corner. She's not in the house, I'm quite sure of that.' "'And yet you say she loved Mr. Curtis?' "'Loved him devotedly. Then what possible reason could she have for deserting him? Why should she—' A knock at the door interrupted me. Mrs. Lawrence, who was sitting nearest it, rose quickly and opened it. I caught a glimpse, in the semi-darkness of the hall, of a woman in a maid's cap and apron. She gave her mistress a letter, whispering as she did so a swift sentence in her ear. I heard Mrs. Lawrence's low exclamation of surprise as she held the letter up to the light and read the superscription. Then she turned swiftly toward us, her face pale with emotion. "'It's a note,' she cried, "'a note from Marcia. It will explain,' and she handed the envelope to Curtis. "'A note,' he stammered, "'addressed to me? In Marcia's writing. Read it. It will explain,' she repeated. He took it with trembling hand, went to the window, and tore it open. I saw his lips quivering as he read it. I saw the white intensity with which Mrs. Lawrence watched his face. I was conscious, too, of another presence in the room, and I glanced around to see that the maid stood leaning forward in the open doorway, her eyes sparkling with eagerness, her mouth working, her hands clasping and unclasping convulsively. There was something sinister in her dark, expressive face, in her attitude, something almost of exulting, of triumph. Curtis crushed the letter in his hand with a quick movement of despair and turned to us distraught, flushed, astounded. "'It tells nothing,' he faltered, "'nothing. It, it, I can't believe it. Read it, Mr. Lester,' and he held the sheet of paper toward me. There were only a few lines upon it. Dearest, I cannot be your wife. How shall I tell you? It is quite, quite impossible. Oh, believe me, sweetheart, nothing but the certainty of that could keep me from you. I am fleeing. I cannot see you, cannot speak to you. There can be no explanation. Only I shall love you always. Is it wrong to write that now, I wonder? Please do not attempt to follow me, to seek me out. That will only mean sorrow for us both, sorrow and shame. Perhaps some day, when the wound heals, will it ever heal? I can tell you, can bear to see you. But, oh, not now. Marcia Lawrence End of Chapter 4《Chapters 5 and 6 of That Affair at Elizabeth. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Affair at Elizabeth by Burton E. Stevenson Chapter 5 Deeper in the Maze I sat for a moment half-dazed with this astonishing note in my fingers. Then I read it through again. There could be no doubting the sincerity of the writer, her passionate earnestness. I cannot be your wife. It is quite, quite impossible. But why was it impossible? Clearly not from any lack of affection. If the note proved anything, it proved that Marcia Lawrence loved Burr Curtis far beyond the usual application of the word. Why, then, had she fled? There can be no explanation. There was nothing left but flight. The marriage was impossible. But why should it be impossible? Was not that too strong a term? Yet she no doubt believed it. Something had happened. There had been some sudden and startling revelation, the revelation of a secret so hideous that rather than betray it, rather than risk an explanation, she had fled. But that was such a desperate thing to do, such a suicidal thing, and a woman does not throw away her happiness thoughtlessly. I glanced at Curtis, who had sunk down again into his chair and sat staring straight before him. Was there in his past some unnameable stain which had lain hidden till this last moment, which this stainless woman had shrunk from, horrified? Or was there, after all, another man, a man perhaps whom she had never intentionally encouraged, yet who had fallen thrall to her none the less, who had determined to possess her, and who, by some trick, some desperate throw, had managed, at the last moment, to snatch her away from Curtis? Had she fled from the house of her own volition? Was there any possible explanation of such a flight? none except that she had suddenly found herself face to face with the fact that she no longer loved the man she was about to marry, face to face with a future so intolerable that any shame, any disgrace was preferable to it. Yet as I looked again at the note's wording, I recognized anew the absurdity of such a theory. Whatever the solution of the mystery, there could be no doubting Marcia Lawrence's love for Burr Curtis whomever she had loved in the past it was certain that now she loved only him and even in mrs lawrence's attitude i seemed to discern an affection for him more intense than is usually bestowed upon a son-in-law at least until he has been tested in the crucible of marriage there could be i told myself only one other explanation marcia lawrence had been abducted it was true, as her mother had pointed out, that a single scream would have alarmed the house, but perhaps that scream had never been uttered. It could have been prevented easily enough, and there had been no one with her at the time except her maid. Her maid! And I sat suddenly upright. I felt that I had found the key. It was your daughter's maid gave you this, Mrs. Lawrence, I asked. Yes, she answered, turning toward me with a start which told me that she had again sunk into reverie. She said she had just found it on Marcia's dresser. It's strange, I said, that it wasn't found before this. You were in your daughter's room, I suppose, after she disappeared? Yes, several times. And you didn't see this note? No, I did not notice it. Is the maid an old servant? Yes, she said, Lucy has been in the family for many years. "'And you've always found her perfectly trustworthy?' "'I have no cause of complaint against her,' she answered, "'and though her voice showed no sign of emotion, "'I saw a sudden trembling seize her "'and shake her convulsively for a moment. "'Was it fear? Was it anger? Was it... "'Curtis saw it, too, "'and attributing it to a very different cause "'moved impatiently in his chair.' I felt that I was hampered by these witnesses. I must get rid of them if I was to have freedom of action, and without freedom of action I could do nothing. I turned again to the sheet of paper in my hand and examined it with care. It was an ordinary linen, unruled. I held it to the light and tried to decipher the watermark, but only two letters were on the sheet. R. E. The remainder of the word had been cut away when the sheet was trimmed to its present size. It seemed to me scarcely to possess the quality which one would expect in Miss Lawrence's writing paper. The writing was in a woman's hand, 
a little irregular, but haste and stress of emotion would account for that. As I examined the writing more closely, I thought the ink seemed strangely fresh, scarcely dry, in fact. And yet, if the maid's story were true, the note had been lying upon the dresser for nearly three hours, and lying there unnoticed. "'There's no doubt that Miss Lawrence wrote this?' I asked. "'None whatever,' answered Curtis, with a quick shake of the head. "'It's her writing. I knew it instantly.' I read the note again, and, satisfied that I had it almost by heart, handed it back to him. "'Of course, Mr. Curtis,' I said, "'you must decide one thing before we go any farther. Will you try to follow her, even though she expressly forbids it?' He sat with knitted brow and quivering mouth, reading the note word by word. "'Yes,' he said brokenly at last, "'yes, I'll try to follow her. I'll do everything I can to find her. I can't live without her.' "'But if the marriage be really impossible?' I suggested. "'Impossible!' and he turned upon me hotly. "'How could it be? What could make it impossible? I tell you, sir, there's nothing on earth can keep us apart.' "'But this—' and I leaned forward and tapped the note. "'Yes, that. I can't explain it. At least the only explanation I can give is that it's a hideous mistake.' "'A mistake?' "'But Miss Lawrence wasn't an emotional woman,' I questioned, "'not a woman to be carried away by a moment's passion?' "'Oh, no, quite the contrary. "'Not a woman who would jump at a conclusion,' I persisted, "'not a woman who would condemn a man unheard, "'who would overlook the possibility of mistake "'and be convinced by what we lawyers call circumstantial evidence?' "'She was not such a woman at all,' he said decidedly. "'She was just the opposite of all that.' "'That makes it more difficult,' I pointed out. "'I know. I've thought it all out as well as I'm able. "'Only there's a blank wall I can't get past. "'Besides, if there's a reason, I have the right to know it.' "'Yes,' I assented heartily. "'Undoubtedly you have the right to know it. "'There we're on solid ground. "'Well, that point is settled, then. "'And now I must ask you another question, Mr. Curtis, "'which you may resent.' but which it is absolutely necessary I should ask if I am to be of any help to you. I think I can guess what it is, Mr. Lester, and he smiled grimly. Since Marcia disappeared I have reviewed carefully my whole past life. I can find nothing in it which would justify in the slightest degree such an action. I have not been a saint, but at least I have never been dishonorable nor dissolute. Does that answer the question? Perfectly, I said. There could be no doubting his utter truthfulness. And your family history? Is neither long nor brilliant. My father and mother both died when I was a baby. I was raised by my grandparents. They lived in New York? No, on Long Island. My grandfather's name was John Curtis. He managed an estate belonging to a New York banker. He was an honest and honorable man. And he is dead? Yes. He and his wife have been dead ten years and more. You have no brothers or sisters? No, nor any other near relatives. That was the end of that theory, then. If the secret did not concern Curtis, it must concern Miss Lawrence herself. More and more I felt that she was the victim of a plot, of the maid's complicity I had not the shadow of a doubt, but was Mrs. Lawrence a party to it, too? I turned back to her. She was apparently so busy with her own thoughts that she paid no heed to what was passing. How explain her calmness, her lack of interest? How, except on the theory that she knew where her daughter was, had assisted in her disappearance and approved of it? I felt my blood warm suddenly in Curtis's behalf. If he had been the victim of an adventuress, it should be my business to expose her. But a second glance at Mrs. Lawrence's face showed me the folly of such a thought. She was no adventuress. She was a gentle, cultured, Christian woman who had suffered, as all mortals must, but had still preserved her sweetness and serenity, as few mortals do. Yet more and more was I perplexed by that indefinable abstraction in her behavior, which seemed somehow out of tune with the circumstances. Perhaps she was really more moved than she seemed to be. Perhaps her apparent indifference was in reality only an admirable self-control. 
I fancied that it had given way for an instant when she was telling us the story of her daughter's disappearance. If I could only hit upon some way to startle her out of her self-possession, I might yet learn. She turned suddenly and met my eyes. She flushed painfully, perhaps she read my thought, and instantly I blamed myself for my clumsiness in permitting my suspicion to appear in my face. It was a mischance not easily retrieved. "'I have told you all I know,' she said, rising quickly and answering the question I had not uttered. "'I feel the need of rest. If I can help you in any way, command me.' "'Thank you,' I answered, and opened the door for her. She paused on the threshold, glanced around. Her eyes rested on Burr Curtis's dreary face. In an instant she was beside him, bending over him with infinite tenderness. "'Dear boy,' she said, so low I could scarcely hear her, and smoothed back his hair with a gesture almost motherly. "'Dear boy, don't worry so. I'm sure it will all come right.' He looked up and smiled at her tremulously. With a quick impulsiveness she stooped and kissed him, then went rapidly from the room, leaving me at least more puzzled than before at this sudden glimpse of unsuspected depths of tenderness. I closed the door after her and turned back to Curtis. "'Has Mrs. Lawrence favoured your suit for her daughter's hand?' I asked. "'Favoured it?' he repeated. "'Yes, from the very first. "'Then in your opinion she couldn't have had anything to do with this disappearance, advised it, perhaps assisted in it?' "'No,' he said decidedly, "'that's absurd.' "'And yet,' I began, "'if you knew her,' he interrupted, "'you would see its absurdity. "'She has always been most kind to me. "'You saw—' "'Yes,' I nodded. "'She has always been like that. "'She has treated me as a dearly beloved son "'ever since we told her of our engagement.' "'There has been no cloud? Not the slightest. She seemed to share in her daughter's happiness and in mine. She has told me more than once that she thought fate had made us for each other. And she helped on the wedding day? In a thousand ways. She and Marcia worked together upon the trousseau. She helped with all the plans. Surely, Mr. Lester, if she objected, she wouldn't have waited till the last minute to make her objection known.' "'Most certainly she would not,' I agreed. "'Besides,' Curtis added hoarsely, "'I don't believe that even her mother could have kept Marcia from me.' "'She's a widow?' I asked. "'Yes, her husband has been dead ten or twelve years. Marcia is the only child.' "'She seems to have had her share of sorrow,' I remarked. "'Her face shows it. "'She has not been quite well lately, "'but she was always a little, well, sad, it seemed to me.' serious you know smiling sometimes but rarely laughing i fancied she grieved for her husband but i really know nothing about it she doesn't look very strong i hazarded in the hope that curtis really knew more than he supposed she isn't strong but i've never seen her really ill she is subject to spells of depression so marcia told me of course i've known her only six months so there was an old trouble as i had thought beside which this new one seemed of little moment. She had been schooled by suffering. Perhaps I had misjudged her in thinking her indifferent, but it was evident that I could get no further information from Curtis. "'You were at the church,' I asked, when you heard that Miss Lawrence had disappeared. "'Yes,' he answered hoarsely. "'Royce brought me word. "'And you came straight here?' "'Yes. "'And searched for her?' Where could I search? I was utterly at sea. I, I don't remember just what I did at first. But you didn't search the house nor the grounds? Why should I have done that when Mrs. Lawrence had already done it thoroughly? he demanded. True, I assented. After all, I had no right to shake his faith in her upon a mere suspicion. I was overwhelmed, he added. I was too dazed to think. Royce said he'd wire for you. I'm glad he did, for I'm utterly unable to decide what to do. I should like you to advise me. Well, Mr. Lawrence, I said there's plainly only one thing to be done, that is, to find Miss Lawrence and demand an explanation from her own lips. Whether or not this is the wisest course may be open to question, but if I were in your place I think I'd do just as you are doing and take the risk. 
"'But to find her, how can I do that? I can't set a detective on her track.' "'No, of course not,' I agreed. "'But I think we can get along without a detective.' "'We must. Detectives talk too much, and this thing mustn't get into the papers.' "'I don't see how you can prevent that. It was to have been a church wedding, wasn't it?' "'Yes, a church wedding.' "'With an invited list of guests?' "'Certainly.' "'And they were present at the church, weren't they?' Curtis groaned, and I saw the perspiration start out across his forehead. "'Present,' echoed Mr. Royce. "'I should say they were. The church was crowded. And we were waiting there in the minister's study, worrying because it was so late, when word came—' "'Don't,' protested Curtis with a despairing gesture. "'I'd never thought of that. I've been thinking only of myself. Of course the papers will have it.' And he groaned again. "'Well, there's no use worrying about it,' interposed Mr. Royce. "'What is done is done. The thing is to find Miss Lawrence, and if anybody can find her, Lester can. I'm sure that five minutes' talk with her will straighten out the whole tangle. There's been an absurd mistake of some sort.' "'No doubt,' I assented, though in my heart I did doubt it very much. At any rate, the five minutes' talk could do no harm.' "'Now you go away somewhere for a day or two "'and leave this thing in our hands,' added our junior. "'What you need is rest. "'Don't worry any more than you can help. "'Let us know where you are, "'and we'll wire you as soon as we have any information. "'That's good advice, isn't it, Lester?' "'Very good,' I said. "'I hope Mr. Curtis will follow it.' "'No, no,' he protested. "'I can't go away. "'I must stay here. "'I couldn't stand it to go away.' "'May I speak to you frankly, Mr. Curtis?' I asked quietly. "'Please do,' he said. "'Speak as frankly as you like.' "'Well, then,' I began, "'you'll pardon me for saying it, "'but I don't believe you can help us any just at present. "'Besides, you need to pull yourself together.' "'That's true,' he agreed, "'and glanced at his trembling hands. "'Take my advice,' I went on earnestly, "'and Mr. Royce's advice. "'Leave Elizabeth for a little while.' There isn't much chance of my finding Miss Lawrence for a day or two. You must get your calmness and self-possession back, for you'll need them. Yes, he said hoarsely, yes, I'll need them. Very well, I'll do as you say, Mr. Lester. Only it's deuced selfish of me to throw my troubles on your shoulders in this way. Selfish nothing, cried our junior. Where will you go? I don't know, answered Curtis helplessly. "'Go to one of the beaches near New York. "'The sea air and surf will do you good. "'Let us know where you are. "'Then, if we want you, we won't have any trouble finding you, "'and you can get back here in an hour or two. "'There's one thing Mr. Curtis can do,' I said. "'A photograph of Miss Lawrence might prove a great help.' "'Why, of course he assented, and thrust his hand into an inner pocket. "'But after an instant's hesitation he drew it out empty.' "'I can't give you that one,' he said. "'I must keep that one. "'I'll send you another. "'You're at the Sheridan?' "'Yes. "'I'll leave it there for you. "'But please don't use it unless you absolutely have to. "'I won't use it at all if I can avoid it,' I assured him. "'I promise you that it won't go out of my hands. "'Thank you,' he said. "'I knew you'd understand. "'As soon as you have any news, you'll wire me. "'The very moment. "'I want you to rely on us. "'I will.' and not worry? I'll try not to. And he was gone. As the door closed behind him, Mr. Royce looked at me with a somewhat guilty countenance. You see, I've got you into it again, Lester, he began. I hope you don't mind. I don't. Rather the contrary. It's a little out of our line, he added, but for a friend, and I certainly pity the poor fellow, we lawyers have to do peculiar things sometimes. "'I've done more peculiar ones than this,' I said. "'This is, at bottom, merely a matter of finding an important witness who is missing.' "'Thank you, Lester,' he said, and held out his hand. "'I didn't want to seem to be imposing on you.' "'You're not,' I assured him again, and rose. "'Now I think I'd better be getting to work. "'Can I be of any help?' he asked, rising too. "'If not, I'll take the 410 back to New York.' I think Curtis needs a little looking after. I'll hunt him up and take him with me. Besides, my wife is so wrought up over this affair that she wants to get home. 
"'Very well,' I assented. "'Curtis will need someone to protect him from the reporters. "'It's a wonder they haven't treed him before this.' "'They tried to,' said Mr. Royce, smiling grimly. "'I succeeded in keeping them off. "'He was too preoccupied to notice. "'There's nothing else I can do?' "'No, I think not. "'If I need you, I'll wire. "'You won't need me.' and he smiled again. You know I'm no good at this kind of work. I know you'll be working harder than I will, keeping up with things at the office. Don't worry about that. You intend to stay here? Yes, but only for a day or two, I trust. I can't think it a very difficult task to find a young woman who has run away in broad daylight in her wedding finery. Somebody must have seen her, that is, if she ran away at all. "'No doubt,' he agreed. "'Of course you'll find her. "'It's not about that I'm worrying so much. "'It's about her motive for doing such a thing. "'It seems preposterous to suppose that any woman in her right mind "'would run away half an hour before her wedding. "'Curtis saw her at ten o'clock and found her happy. "'Yet an hour later she had taken this desperate step. "'I wonder, Lester, if you realize just how desperate it was.' "'Yes,' I said, "'I think I do.' "'Well, I'm free to confess I didn't until I saw its effect on my wife. "'Why, Lester, it was suicidal. "'It means social ostracism, no less. "'Even if it doesn't altogether ruin her life, it will always shadow it. "'It's something she can never outlive.' "'Yes,' I said again, "'it's all that. "'And yet she was a thoughtful, self-controlled, well-balanced woman who would foresee all this.' who would realize the consequences more clearly than we can do. Lester, what was it drove her to it? Ah, if only I knew, but I'm going to find out. I hope you will, and yet I fear it, too. I'm afraid to think of it. I'm afraid to try to guess the secret. I'm afraid I'll unearth some grisly, loathsome skeleton which should never have seen the light. But I'm sure of one thing, he added his face hardening. I think you suspected, too. What was that? Whatever the secret is, Mrs. Lawrence knows it. Yes, I agreed. I believe she does, and had a hand in her daughter's disappearance. Yes, I said again, I think that very likely. He stood for a moment longer, looking at me as though half inclined to say something more. Then he shook hands abruptly and left the room. As I turned to sit down again, I noticed, in the chair from which I had arisen, something white crushed into one corner of the seat. I picked it up. It was a handkerchief of dainty lace, and it was damp. With tears? End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 An Astonishing Request I sat down and examined my find more closely. I'm no connoisseur of lace, yet even I could appreciate the handkerchief's exquisite beauty. But how came it here, crushed into a corner of this chair? Whose was it? Some instinct, or was it merely a delusive hope, told me that it belonged to Marcia Lawrence, that it was she who had left it here, that the tears which dampened it were her tears, tears of bitter, bitter sorrow for dead hopes and a future which had changed from gold to grey. She had stolen into the library for a moment's peace, that she might face her sorrow and decide what she must do. She had left it. But I shook myself together impatiently. All this was merely theorizing. I must lay my foundation first, get my facts. Then perhaps it might be possible to build a theory which would prove the right one. Thus far in the investigation I felt that I had been met with evasion rather than frankness. I suspected that an attempt was being made to puzzle and bewilder me. I could see that my presence in the house was unwelcome to Mrs. Lawrence. Well, my stay would be a short one. I dropped the handkerchief into my pocket, opened the door, and stepped out into the hall. The front door was open, and two men were tugging an immense palm through it. Another was engaged in taking down the wreaths of Smilax. By the tenderness with which he handled them I recognized the decorator. He stopped and looked at me inquiringly as I went toward him. "'I've come down from New York,' I explained, at the request of Mr. Curtis, to assist him in finding Miss Lawrence. "'You, I believe, are the last person who is known to have seen her. I'd like to ask you a few questions.' 
"'Go ahead,' he said, beaming with self-importance. "'I'll be glad to tell you anything I know, sir. "'Do you remember what time it was when you called Miss Lawrence down "'to have a last look at the decorations?' "'It must have been nearly half-past eleven, sir. "'I remember hearing a clock strike eleven "'and thinking it'd take me about half an hour to get through. "'Did you notice anything peculiar in her behavior? "'Peculiar? No, sir. "'She was very kind and said some nice things about my work. "'She did not seem sad nor depressed? "'Oh, no, sir, quite the contrary. "'When she left you, did she return upstairs?' "'I think so, sir. At least she started for the stairs. I stepped into the dining-room for a moment to make sure everything was all right, and when I came out again she was gone. Was there anyone else in the hall?' "'No, sir, I think not. Not just at that moment, though of course people were passing back and forth through it all the time. Did you notice a man loitering about, a stranger?' "'Middle-aged, dark-complexioned, with a dark beard or moustache, rather striking in appearance, perhaps a little dissolute?' "'No, sir,' he answered with a stare of surprise. "'I didn't see any stranger about the whole morning. Nobody I didn't know.' "'I confess I was rather disappointed. I had hoped that my shot would tell. "'And you heard no unusual noise, no scream, nor anything of that sort?' "'No, sir, though I was so busy and worried, I dare say I wouldn't have heard a cannon shot. "'When did you learn that something was wrong?' "'I heard Mrs. Lawrence asking if anyone had seen her daughter. "'Then she sent some of the servants to look for her. "'What time was that?' "'About ten minutes after I had spoken to her. "'Yes, what then?' "'Well, I didn't pay much attention at first, but when the bridesmaids came, they raised such a hullabaloo that I couldn't help but take notice. "'What did Mrs. Lawrence do?' "'Why, she tried to quiet them. I must say she was the coolest one in the house, except one. Who was that?' "'Miss Lawrence's maid. She just sat there on the stairs and glowered and grinned and chewed her nails and never said a word. She gave me the creeps.' I could swear she knew all about it and was glad of it. I repressed a chuckle of satisfaction. Here was better luck than I had expected. "'How was Miss Lawrence dressed when you saw her?' I asked. "'All in rustly white. I judged it was her wedding dress. "'And you say she seemed quite as usual?' "'Yes, sir, only of course excited, as any woman would be.' though calm, too, and with a sort of deep glow in her eyes when she looked at you. I can't describe it, sir, but I remember thinking that the man who was to get her was a mighty lucky fellow. Did you know her, sir? No, I said, I've never seen her. Ah, he added, closing his eyes for an instant, if you'd seen her then you'd never forget it. I never will. I never saw another woman to touch her. And he turned away to his work with the vision he had conjured up evidently still before him. As I started along the hall, I saw through the open front door a mail carrier coming up the walk. I hastened to meet him. This was another fortunate chance. "'How many deliveries do you make a day out here?' I asked, as he came up the steps with a bundle of letters in his hand. I could guess the belated congratulations which were among them. "'Only two, morning and afternoon,' he answered. "'What time in the morning?' "'About nine o'clock, usually. "'It was about that time this morning?' "'Yes, sir, maybe ten minutes after nine. "'Who took the mail?' "'I put it in the box here in the vestibule, as I always do,' he said, "'and suited the action to the word. "'I watched him as he walked away.' So it had not been a letter which had caused Miss Lawrence's sudden panic. That reduced the possibilities to two. Either she had received a visitor or a telegram. I must endeavor to— A voice at my elbow aroused me. "'Mrs. Lawrence wishes to see you, sir,' it said. I turned to find standing beside me the woman who had brought the note to Mrs. Lawrence in the library, the woman whose attitude of malignant triumph had so startled me. I blessed the chance which made it possible for me to question her alone. "'Very well,' I said. "'Are you Mrs. Lawrence's maid?' "'No, sir, I am Miss Marcia's maid.' "'Ah,' I said, and permitted myself to look at her more closely.' 
She was a woman apparently somewhat over thirty. She had very black hair and eyes, and her face, while not actually repellent, had in it a certain fierceness and hardness far from attractive. A fiery and emotional nature was evident in every line of it, a sinister nature, too, it seemed to me, and I remembered her as I had seen her standing in the library door, exulting in another's misery. I pictured her as the decorator had described her, sitting on the stair, grinning and biting her nails in a kind of infernal triumph. Why should Miss Lawrence have chosen such a woman to attend her? As I looked at her I saw the folly of attempting to win her confidence. The whip was the only weapon that could touch her, and it must be wielded mercilessly. "'Mrs. Lawrence wishes to see you,' she said again, and I fancied there was defiance in the eyes she turned upon me for the merest instant. "'In a moment. Was it you who found the note your mistress left for Mr. Curtis?' "'Yes, sir,' and she glanced at me again, this time with a quick suspicion. "'It was on her dressing-table, I believe?' "'Yes, sir. How did you happen to find it?' "'I just happened to see it, sir.' "'It was lying in plain sight?' "'Yes, sir. Not concealed in any way, nothing lying over it?' She hesitated an instant and shot me another quick glance before she answered. "'I believe not, sir,' she said at last. "'Of course it wouldn't be concealed,' I said reassuringly. "'Miss Lawrence probably left it where she thought it would be most quickly seen, don't you think so?' "'Yes, sir, I suppose so.' "'And her dressing-table was a very conspicuous place?' "'Yes, sir, very conspicuous.' "'In that case,' I said slowly, "'it seems most peculiar that the letter wasn't discovered at once.' She flushed hotly under my gaze and opened her lips to reply, but thought better of it and started hastily up the stair. I followed her in silence, but I had much to think about. What connection had she with Miss Lawrence's disappearance? What connection could she have? Miss Lawrence would scarcely make a confidant of her maid, more especially of such a maid as this. At the stairhead I held her back for a final question. When did you see your mistress last? When she left her room to go downstairs to look at the decorations, she answered, so docilely that I was inclined to believe her former defiance wholly my imagination. You remained behind in the room? Yes, sir. And she did not return? No, sir. Then how do you explain the presence of the letter on the dresser? She flushed again, more hotly than before. She realized that I had caught her in a lie. "'I—I I can't explain it, sir,' she stammered. "'I didn't consider it any of my business,' she added fiercely. "'I think you'll find it difficult to explain,' I said with irony, "'even more difficult than how it came to lie there unperceived for nearly three hours. "'You'll pardon me if I find the story hard to believe.' "'It's nothing to me whether or not you believe it,' she retorted, "'and made a motion to go on again.' no i said wait a moment which is her room this one here and she pointed to a half-open door just beside us ignoring her gesture of protest i pushed the door back and stepped inside the room was a large and pleasant one well lighted and looking out upon the grove at the east side of the house there was some little disorder apparent, and over a chair at the farther side of the room I saw a veil lying, no doubt the bridal veil. For the moment I did not seek to see more, but turned back into the hall. "'Nothing there,' I said, as though my inspection of the room was ended. "'I suppose you helped Miss Lawrence to dress?' "'Yes, sir. And she had on her wedding gown when she went downstairs?' "'Yes, sir, all but the veil.' "'What was the color of the gown?' "'White, sir,' she answered, with evident contempt. "'White satin made very plain. "'With a train?' "'Yes, sir, with a train.' "'Thank you,' I said. "'Plainly, a woman garbed in that fashion "'must be a marked object wherever she went. "'Then, seeing that the maid waited for further questions, "'I added, "'That is all, I believe.' 
She opened a door just across the hall and motioned me to precede her. I found myself in a pleasant sitting-room and looked about for Mrs. Lawrence, but she was not there. The maid went to an inner door, which stood half open, and knocked. In a moment came a low voice, and I heard a rustle of draperies. Instinctively I knew that Mrs. Lawrence had been upon her knees. But I was not prepared for the deep distress which I saw in her countenance the instant she appeared upon the threshold. So worn and drawn was it, so changed even in the brief time since I had seen her last, that I scarcely knew her. What had happened? Was her self-control giving way under the strain, or had there been some new shock, some more poignant blow which she had been unable to withstand? She came straight to me where I stood staring, perhaps a little brutally, and lifted tear-dimmed eyes to mine. "'Mr. Lester,' she said in a choked voice, "'I must ask that this search for Marcia cease.'" End of chapter 6「Chapters seven and eight of that affair at Elizabeth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That affair at Elizabeth by Burton E. Stevenson. Chapter seven. Tangled threads. I stared at her a moment without replying. So she was guilty. So she did know. I heard the opening of the door as the maid left the room, and the sound somehow restored me a portion of my self-control. "'Cease. But why?' I asked. "'Surely—' "'Marcia has said that the marriage is impossible,' she interrupted. "'Is that not enough?' "'Mr. Curtis does not think so. And if it is impossible, he at least has a right to know why.' "'Marcia has decided not. She has no wish to bring reproach to the memory of a respected man who— she checked herself, but she had already said too much. "'Then you know why your daughter left so suddenly,' I questioned. "'But an hour ago you said you didn't know.' "'I did not then,' she murmured. "'I have no wish to know,' I went on rapidly, noting her sudden pallor. "'I have no right to know. But I'm here to find Miss Lawrence, so that Mr. Curtis can at least have a last talk with her. That seems a reasonable demand. Do you know where she is?' no she answered explosively she is not in this house assuredly not i have already told you she is not here i fancied perhaps she had returned such a suspicion is absurd you've had no word from her not a single word then it wasn't she who told you the cause of her disappearance she told me nothing i had no need to ask who it was some instinct told me it was the maid and you saw her last? When she left me to dress, as I've already told you. I've been speaking the truth, Mr. Lester. Pardon me, I said, I hadn't the least doubt of it. But I'm sure you can appreciate my position, can look at it from Mr. Curtis's side. Perhaps you suspect where Miss Lawrence is, without being absolutely certain. If you would tell me— She stopped me with a sudden gesture. I saw that I had touched the truth. "'Or at least I persisted, pressing my advantage. "'If you know why your daughter fled, you might yourself tell Mr. Curtis.' "'Again she stopped me. "'The secret is not mine,' she said hoarsely. "'Whose is it? Who has the right to tell?' "'No one. And you will let it wreck two lives?' "'I saw the spasm of pain which crossed her face. "'She must yield. A moment more and I should know the secret.' "'Tomorrow. Give me till tomorrow,' she cried. "'Perhaps you're right. I must think. I cannot decide now, instantly. There are so many things to consider, the dead as well as the living. Very well,' I agreed. I will call tomorrow morning. At eleven, not before. Tomorrow at eleven, then. And I hope you'll decide, Mrs. Lawrence, to help me all you can. The living come before the dead.' She bowed without replying, and seeing how deadly white she was, I checked the words which rose to my lips, and let myself out into the hall. The maid was standing just outside the door. I wondered how much she had heard of what had passed within. "'One moment,' I said as she started for the stairway, and I stepped again into Miss Lawrence's room. 
It had grown too dark there to see anything distinctly, for this room was not flooded, as her mother's had been, by the last rays of the sun. But in a moment I switched on the light. The maid stared from the threshold, her face dark with anger, but not daring to interfere. "'This is the dressing-table, isn't it?' I asked, walking toward it. "'Yes, sir,' she answered sullenly. "'It was here you found the letter?' "'Yes, sir.' "'You persist in that farce,' I demanded, wheeling round upon her. She did not answer, only stared back without flinching. I realized that here was a will not easily overcome. "'Very well,' I said quietly at last. "'I shall get along, then, in spite of you.' And I returned to my inspection of the room. There was a writing-desk in one corner with pens, ink, and paper. I picked up a sheet of paper and looked at it. I dipped a pen in the ink and wrote a few words upon it. Then I blotted it, folded it, and placed it in my pocket. "'Now we can go,' I said, and switched off the light. She led the way down the stairs without replying. "'My hat is in the library,' I said, as we reached the foot, and I turned down the lower hall. The library was even darker than the room upstairs had been, for the trees around the house seemed to shadow especially the windows of this wing. I noted how the windows extended to the floor and opened upon a little balcony. One of the windows was open, and I went to it and looked out. A flight of steps connected one end of the balcony with the ground, and I fancied from the steps I could discern a faint path running away among the trees. A convulsive sob at the door brought me around. It was the maid, who had entered and was glaring at me with a face to which the growing darkness gave an added repulsiveness. The sob, which had more of anger than of sorrow in it, had burst from her involuntarily, called forth, no doubt, by her inability to hinder me in my investigations, to show me the door, to kick me out. I could see her growing hatred of me in her eyes, in the grip of the hands she pressed against her bosom, and a certain reciprocal anger arose within me. "'Here is a handkerchief of your mistress,' I said, plunging my hand into my pocket and drawing forth the square of lace. "'Please return it to her wardrobe. It's valuable,' I added, with a sudden burst of inspiration, "'especially so since it's her bridal handkerchief.' The shot told. She took the handkerchief with a hand that shook convulsively, and I determined to risk a second guess. "'She left it here,' I said. "'She left it here when she went out by yonder window and ran through the grove. "'Shall I tell you where she went? "'But you know.' "'I do not burst from her. "'It's a lie. "'You know,' I repeated remorselessly. "'You followed her there. "'It was there she wrote that note which you brought back with you "'and which you found on her dresser.' "'No, no!' "'The words were two sobs rather than two articulate sounds.' "'Don't lie to me. If the note was written here, why did she use a writing-paper different from her own? "'You're playing with fire. Take care that it doesn't burn you.' But I had touched the wrong note. "'Burn me!' she cried. "'You think you can frighten me? Well, you can't. I'm not that kind.' And indeed, as I looked at her, I saw that she spoke the truth. "'Very well,' I said. "'Do as you think best. I've warned you.' and without waiting for her to answer I passed before her down the hall, not without the thought that she might plunge a knife into my back. She was certainly that kind. I opened the door myself and closed it behind me, then started down the walk. But in a moment I dodged aside among the trees and hastened around the house. I was determined to follow that path which started from the library balcony. I must see whither it led." End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The Path Through the Grove I had no trouble in finding the path and in following it through the grove, noting how the trees screened it from the street. I reached a hedge enclosing a garden which the path skirted, and finally a second hedge which seemed to be the one bounding the estate. The path led to a gate which opened upon the grounds of a cottage just beyond. I could see that there was a garden, and that the cottage was covered with vines, but no further details were discernible. Suddenly a light flashed out from one of the windows, and I saw a woman moving about within, no doubt preparing supper. 
but at that moment I caught the sound of hurried footsteps along the path behind me, and shrank aside into the shadow of the trees, just in time to avoid another woman, whom, as she dashed past, I recognized as the dark-faced maid. She crossed the garden without slackening her pace and entered the house. I saw her approach the other woman, pause apparently to speak a word to her, and then the two disappeared together. What was happening within this house? Was it here that Miss Lawrence had found refuge? And as I turned this question over and over in my mind, staring reflectively at the lighted window before me, it seemed to me more and more probable that I had already reached the end of my search. The fugitive must have escaped by some avenue screened from the public gaze, else she would surely have been noticed. She must have known a place of refuge before she started. A woman of her self-poise would not rush wildly forth with no goal in view. And lastly, that goal must have been close at hand, or she could not have escaped discovery. The house before me answered all of these conditions. But how could I make certain that Miss Lawrence was really there? Suppose I burst in upon her. What could I say? I could not ask her to tell me the story. Indeed, I would not even know her if I met her face to face. I must see the photograph first, which Curtis had promised to leave for me at the hotel. Besides, I asked myself, and in this matter I confess I was very willing to be convinced, would it not be wiser, more merciful, to wait till morning, till the first shock had passed, till she had time to rally a little, to get her calmness back? then i could dare to approach her to show her how she had wronged burr curtis to persuade her to see him it were better for both her and curtis that they should not meet for a day or two they would have need of all their courage all their self-control for that meeting must reveal a secret which it chilled me to think of at least i would try to force no entrance to the cottage now I shrank from any show of violence. Curtis would countenance nothing of that sort. To approach the cottage now, while the maid was within, would be a tactical error, would be to court failure. She could easily prevent my seeing her mistress. She would, no doubt, shut the door in my face. Why should I show her that I suspected Miss Lawrence's place of refuge? Why put her on her guard and urge the fugitive to farther flight? How much wiser to wait until the maid was absent, till I could make sure of seeing Miss Lawrence, and then calmly and clearly lay the case before her. Yes, decidedly, I would wait. I even found it in my heart to regret that I had already showed the maid so much of my suspicions. I would better have kept them to myself. Convinced by this last argument, I made my way back to the street, and as I passed the Lawrence grounds, I was impressed again by their extent and excellent order. At the front gate a curious crowd still lingered, staring at the silent, darkened house whose drawn blinds gave no hint of life within, or listening to the knowing gossip of three or four alert young fellows whom I recognized as reporters. There was still a policeman there, and he was quite willing to be drawn into talk, to tell all he knew, and much that he did not know. "'Who lives in that cottage back yonder?' I asked, after an unimportant question or two. "'The Kingdon sisters,' he answered. "'The youngest one works in the Lawrence house, a maid or something.' The crowd had collected about us and was listening with ears intent. I caught a quick glitter of interest in the eyes of the reporters, so I ended the talk abruptly by asking the way to the Sheridan house. "'Right down this street, sir,' he said. "'You can't miss it. A big square building on the corner.' As I thanked him and turned away, I caught the cry of newsboys down the street, and in a moment they were among the crowd and were selling their papers right and left. Both the leader and the journal, stirred to unusual enterprise by the day's events, had evidently made use of the largest and blackest type at their command to add emphasis to their headlines. I bought copies of both papers and hurried on to the Sheridan, for I was becoming disagreeably conscious that I had eaten no lunch that day. I found the hotel without difficulty, and after registering, sat down in the office and opened the papers. The reporters, no doubt, would save me a lot of trouble. 
the scene at the church had been even more sensational than i had pictured it for evidently the lawrences were a more important family socially than i had imagined and the list of guests had been correspondingly large they had gathered had gossiped had admired the decorations and criticized each other's gowns a murmur of satisfaction had greeted the whispered announcement that the groom and his best man were waiting in the study the organist played a selection or two and then stopped expectant ready to begin the wedding march the ringing of bells and blowing of whistles announced the noon hour but the bride had not arrived then from somewhere came the sudden whisper that something was wrong a shiver ran through the crowd as two carriages drew up at the church door heads were craned and a sigh of relief ran around as the bridesmaids were seen to alight but where was the bride there was no bride the bride had disappeared uneasiness changed to wonder wonder to astonishment as the details were gradually gleaned from the exclamations of the excited young women tongues began to wag innocently at first then inevitably with a touch of malice for the bride's action had been a direct affront to all these people many of them usually well bred waited in the hope of catching a glimpse of the groom's face as he hurried away both he and mrs lawrence had been protected from the reporters but the decorator and some of the lawrence servants had evidently made the most of their opportunities for the papers had the details of the disappearance substantially as i had learned them and nobody had been found who had seen the bride leave the house or had caught a glimpse of her during her flight that was the gist of the information contained in the papers both of them gave space to much speculation as to the reason for this remarkable event but plainly both were wholly at sea and had no theory to fit the facts so finally i folded them up put them in my pocket made a hasty toilet and went in to dinner that over i again sought the reading-room and lighted a reflective cigar i had said to mrs lawrence that the cause of her daughter's disappearance the mystery underlying it did not concern me yet that was by far the most interesting feature of the case to trace the girl must prove an easy task indeed i fancied it already as good as accomplished but to probe the secret ah that would not prove so easy there was no reason why i should attempt it and yet i could not keep my mind from dwelling on it with a sort of fascination for i knew it was no ordinary secret it was something dark and terrifying something beside which a woman's happiness and reputation had seemed a little thing before i could hope to make any further progress in that direction i realized that i needed to know more of the family of its history and social standing besides i must be armed cap a pied before i went to that interview which i had determined to seek in the morning with marcia lawrence beg pardon sir said a voice at my elbow and looking up i saw the hotel clerk standing there this is mr lester isn't it yes i answered i have a package here for you he went on and handed me a square envelope it was left here for you this afternoon oh yes i said thank you and i slipped the envelope into my pocket you've had a rather exciting time here to-day i added you mean the wedding that didn't come off he asked smiling it has torn the town wide open and no mistake so i judged from the papers the lawrences are pretty prominent aren't they yes top-notchers especially in church circles i'll bet dr schuyler is all broken up dr schuyler the pastor of their church first presbyterian that big church just down the street yonder they've been great pets of his he was to have performed the ceremony sure they wouldn't have had anybody else nice old fellow too besides he's been their pastor for years here was the source i had been looking for the source from which i might draw detailed and accurate information if i could only reach it i suppose that house next to the church is the parsonage i ventured i had never seen the church but it seemed a safe shot yes the one this side of it i nodded i thought so thank you for giving me the package i added 
and glanced at my watch and rose. "'Oh, that's all right, sir,' he answered, and turned away to his desk. As for me, I lost no time in starting out upon my errand. I would see Dr. Schuyler. I would put the case before him and ask his help. It was nearly eight o'clock, doubtless well past his dinner hour, and I resolved to seek the interview at once. Lights had sprung up along the street, casting long shadows under the trees which edged either side. The windows of the houses gleamed through the darkness, and here and there, where the blinds had not been drawn, I caught glimpses of families gathered together about a paper with heads eagerly bent. From the dim verandas I heard the murmur of excited gossip, and I knew too well what it was all about. Tonight this city, from end to end, could have but a single all-absorbing subject to discuss to wonder at and chatter over with that insatiable curiosity which we inherit from the monkeys. But I had not far to go. The tall, straight spire of the church told me that I had reached my destination, and I turned in at the gate of a house which was unmistakably the parsonage. The maid who took my card at the door returned in a moment to say that Dr. Schuyler was in his study and would see me. I followed her and found the clergyman seated beside a table, upon which were lying the evening papers. A glance at them showed me what he had been reading, and his perturbed face bespoke great inward agitation. He was a small man of perhaps sixty years, with snow-white hair and beard, and a delicate intellectual face. He arose to greet me, my card still in his fingers, and then motioned me to a chair. "'Candidly, Mr. Lester,' he said, "'I was half inclined to excuse myself. "'This has been a trying day for me, "'but I saw that you had come from New York.' "'Yes, and on an errand which I fear "'may not be very welcome to you, Dr. Schuyler. "'Not connected with the deplorable affair of today, I hope?' "'Yes, sir, connected with that. "'But,' and he glanced again at my card apprehensively, "'you are not a reporter.' "'Oh, no,' I laughed, "'and I can easily guess how they've been harassing you. "'I'm acting for Mr. Curtis,' I added, "'resolving quickly that the best thing I could do "'was to tell him the whole story so far as I knew it, "'which I did as briefly as possible. "'He heard me to the end with intent, interested face. "'I think you'll agree with me, Dr. Schuyler,' I concluded, "'that my client is quite right in deciding to demand an explanation.' yes he answered after a moment's thought i suppose he is i'm sure he is it's the most extraordinary thing i ever heard of and the most deplorable until this moment i had hoped that they had gone away to be married elsewhere hoped i asked yes hoped i've seen them together mr lester and it seemed to me an ideal attachment i can conceive of nothing which could keep them apart has any explanation of it occurred to you only one, I said, that Miss Lawrence has been married before, but thought her husband dead, and discovered that he was still alive only at the last moment. But the clergyman shook his head. You don't know Miss Lawrence, he asked. No, I answered. You would see the absurdity of such a theory if you did. I fancied it might have happened when she was very young, I explained, when she was abroad, perhaps. I've even pictured the man to myself as an adventurer, French or Italian, a man of the world, polished, without heart, perhaps even base at bottom, a man who would not hesitate to take advantage of her girlish innocence. My companion smiled faintly. I see you have a lively imagination, Mr. Lester, he said. Don't let it run away with you. She would not be the first to succumb to such a one, I retorted. No, nor the last, I fear. Have you worked out the rest of the story? Granting the premises, the rest is easy enough. She soon found him out and took refuge with her mother. The scoundrel was bought off and disappeared. She supposed him dead, but at the last moment he appeared again. Dr. Schuyler had listened with half-closed eyes. Now he opened them and looked at me amusedly. "'It sounds like some of the yellowbacks I used to read in my unregenerate youth,' he commented. "'I fancy you must have read them too, Mr. Lester. 
"'Now I want you to dismiss that theory,' he went on more earnestly. "'I tell you once for all, it's ridiculous and untrue. "'Rest assured that whatever the secret is, "'it does not in any way reflect upon her.' "'Then that leaves us all at sea,' I pointed out. "'There can be no question of her love for Curtis.' "'None whatever. "'As I said, I've seen them together, "'and I'm sure she loved him devotedly. "'Of his feeling for her you have, of course, "'been able to judge for yourself. "'I've looked forward to the wedding with much pleasure, "'for it seemed to me the least worldly one "'that I had ever been asked to consecrate. "'It is a singular coincidence, though.' He stopped suddenly and glanced about the room. "'Of course this conversation is between ourselves, Mr. Lester.' "'Certainly I assented. I would wish to have it so. "'With that understanding I shall be glad to help you if I can. "'I was about to say that it is a very singular coincidence "'that something of the same sort happened many years ago to Mrs. Lawrence.' End of chapter 8